I am Nora Rowan Schmidt, Executive Director for the Viroqua Chamber Main Street, and you are listening to 54665, the podcast about all things Viroqua and entrepreneur and small business and organization. And we are here with the fantastic Peter Rood. Do we get a clap? Can we do that? Oh, wow, wow, wow. Work? This is great. <laughs> yeah. Got my coffee and my notes. I'm ready to go. Right. So, Peter, tell us all of the reasons that you're fabulous. I mean, we know that you are a board member uh, for the Viroqua Chamber Main Street, an officer, actually, the treasurer. And what else? What else do you do? Well, during my nine to five or actually banker's hours, which more like 730 to like <laughs> whenever you can go home. Right. Um, I am <laughs> the hours. assistant vice president for Associated Bank here in town, and I manage uh, that location, and I'm part of the La Crosse, Prairie du Chien, Holman, Onalaska, La Crosse, uh, Associated Bank region. So uh, all that group, kind of what um, where our people are in terms of, um, you know, going to work and those types of things, uh, we're part of that market, the La Crosse market. So, yep, mm -hmm. yep, that's a big market. So, yeah. So I guess we're here to talk about quite a bit of things. We um, are. I could go on and on and on about these things. <laughs> <laughs> That's and, why we have you on the show, Peter. You and, know. It's, and it also it's funny because you know when you're when you're when I went to college, you're like, oh, you're never gonna do what you go to school for. And actually, I went to school to do economics, so it's actually kind of fitting. I maybe I'm one of the the few that was actually like, and I really didn't believe I was gonna do what. Everybody's like, oh, no, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Or I went in like, I'm not going to do economics. Uh, and here I am. Uh, in so, banking. <laughs> yes, in banking. <laughs> it's um, all about the numbers. So some people, I guess, wanted to be policemen or firemen. Or, right. Or, or archaeologists, or, or archaeologists like me. You know? yeah. Jurassic Park came out during my time, so it was a big thing. Right. I heard a big show on NPR about that, about uh, getting this. But no, I, I know I wasn't like, oh, I want to be a banker when I grew up. But, but I do. I enjoy it. It's nice. But here you are. Here I am. And so because we're talking about all things relevant to small business and people starting businesses and all of the things that go along with that, there's there's really no manual when it comes to figuring out banking. So let's talk about, you know, what's the process when somebody comes in and they're getting ready to start a business and they're a little bit unsure of what the next steps are. Where do you steer people who are coming in just starting their business, maybe with a small amount of money? Yeah, it's it's very difficult, um, you know, with small business and those types of things. There's a lot of uh, tricky things um, outside of banking um, before starting the business. Okay. Um, they really want to refine the product. Okay. So that, I mean, yeah, there's some versions that come out. And of course, the newest iPhone is going to be better than the latest one. And there'll be updates and patches. But making sure that you have a strong standalone product mm -hmm. um, before you even, you know, attempt to get into the market and sell them. So um, what are some ways to refine a product? Give me um, some examples of that because I think that's a really good tip for people that are starting businesses you know maybe they are doing some crafting right now or yeah. something but people have said hey you should sell this in a larger capacity sure what does that look like exactly to refine a product because i think that's important stuff it's interesting um my my mom has a uh, side small business and she makes this beautiful beaded uh, bracelet um, that are made out of like reindeer and it's a very Norwegian um, traditional. And they're uh, sparkly. And they're sparkly. And totally beautiful. And I have of, one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and they're made out of pewter, which is a, a really cool, like braided, available. Uh, you're able to braid it. And usually you find pewter and like silverware and those types of things. But they make right. this pewter that can be braided, um, you know, over in. Sweden and then you can braid it and she um it's a lot of hand stitching it's almost and... so it's it's really really fine thread mm -hmm, basically mm -hmm. yep so going back to how to refine the product so she she's been making these for years and years and years and the first couple that she made she just made for fun sure she's like oh yeah I can do that I'm sure she went to a, a class or something and she wanted to do something fun on the side and and so years back she's like wow that's really nice and she started wearing it and just like that someone came up to her and was like wow where did you get that and I was like oh I made it and she's like well great can you make me one and she's like <laughs> 
sure. So she, you know, got her stuff together and um, got one of those giant magnifiers, like just like it's like uh, almost like the dentist office or I don't get my nails done, but I'm sure they have one with the, those big giant ones like the size of your face. Um, and she's got these little dainty little fingers that she that she stitches with. Um, so, so, so then when the individual got them, she's like, it's great. You should sell these. This is great. And my mom was like, well, yeah, but I don't know. You know what I mean? This, this, it's a lot of work and I really love doing it and I enjoy it. And well, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll try my hand at it. So she knew right away that she's only been wearing hers for, I want to say a month or two before she had, you know, another one out there. So what she did was, um, she, refined what she wanted she went to like three different models right mm -hmm. and said okay these are the three i'm going to sell i'm going to get really good at these three sure um so then she she made quite a few of them she made probably about three or four each and then gave them out for like christmas and birthday and those types of things and said you know i'm really this is what i'm trying to do so hey i'm gonna give this to you happy birthday great they loved it and they're like well just check in with me every couple of weeks see how it's working does any of the stitching fall out you know what happens if you accidentally take a shower and you're still wearing reindeer um, leather you know how does sure. that how does it look over time mm -hmm. and you know my mom's a nurse so she's really she you know where is it you know constantly and so she's always running around she's using her hands a lot so she wanted to see how would it wear over three months six months and that will really refine the product i know she's changed her a string a little bit sure. um to make it um, tighter uh to make it uh, more durable um there's a couple of elements in the actual thread that she uses that's a little bit that she tweaks over time so really refine the product because the last thing you want to do is have that tea set you know, and you hand paint them and then figure out if you, they use, you know, too hot of water, the, the paint smears. Right. Or, or a certain type of dishwashing liquid yes, or whatever it may all be. All of a sudden. Right. That's really know. smart. So, yeah. So really refining it and mm -hmm. getting it out there, getting those trial runs. I mean, you always see once in a while when you're driving down the road, you see those blacked out cars with like the sheets over them because they're driving around and around and around for the right. new model of that car. And of course they don't want you to see it. So they, they look really goofy. I seen them once and I was like, what the <laughs> heck is that? And they're like, well, that's, that's probably a new model car. They just don't want anybody to see what it looks like, but they got to drive it, you know, 5,000, 10,000, however many miles they need um, to right. make sure that it's good. See how so, it does. Mm -hmm. yeah. so really, you know, if you got that product out there, you know, start, start, using it starts you know really being rough on it you know i mean see what kind of you know almost use it can take and so this this model uh, that we're talking about with your with your business can can before you even get it to market can be six months seven months eight months you know those types of things or if this is something you've done since you were you know five that might be a little different you know that your pottery can withstand Mm, slight wear and tear, slight tip overs. I mean, you can't drop it from the top of a building, right. but you know what right. I mean? That you can maybe you want it to be dishwasher safe. And you know, if you do this type with this type of glaze that it can be, I'm not a potter, so I don't know that for sure, but <laughs> I, you know, that's just an example. Right. So it's not an instant gratification process probably. No. Um, so once you get that product refined, you know, then you can start looking about packaging where you want to sell it. Is it going to be locally sold? Sure. Um, you know, yep. what, the how is a yeah. big part of the picture for you sure. You might have the best product, but if you're not a very good business person, your business, you know, is pretty much up to fail before you even start. Mm -hmm. So knowing those nuances that you could, you could make the best tea set, but if you can't, if you don't know how to get it to market, it, you know, you you will not be successful, unfortunately. I right. mean, I might have a really awesome tea set, especially if they make it in town. <laughs> um, but those people that you want to have those tea sets on the East Coast or California, uh, you just if you can't get it there, then it, then that's a problem. Or your margins are too close. Right. Um, if your tea sets to make them to paint them, you start adding your time, which you have to do. Always, always add your time. Right. Unless you want it to be a strict hobby that you just love getting your product out there and you're willing to not make money on it, then great. But if you want this to be a viable business, you have to put in your time and then you have to have margin after that time for growth, uh, for fluctuations in your product. All of a sudden that paint comes from germany and there's an import or they run out of a certain dye that can be very expensive right. um with my mom's bracelets a pewter can get very expensive at times so if you get a roll of pewter all of a sudden the pewter is twice as much 
um, like gold, silver, pewter, all those commodities, um, it can be it can really adjust your um, price point. And oh, if yeah. you're so close on the margins, it, you'll run yourself right out of business. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and all those all those little nuances, right? Um, like shipping. Right? How much does shipping cost? <laughs> Everybody wants, you know, with you have Amazon Prime now, mm -hmm. like, dude, I'm in Viroqua. Right. And I can get a roll of toilet paper in two days and it can be the triple cotton, double sheeted, <laughs> plaited, you know, woven into a, a nice, you know, quilted. Right. In two days, free shipping. Um, and if you have a small business, that's just not possible. Oh, yeah, Ooh. exactly. Well, and one of the things that I want to return to really quickly I think it's really important to talk about um, valuing your time. And what is your time worth? Is there an equation somewhere for determining time or cost of labor? Because I think a lot of people struggle with coming up with that value. And I think many, many people that I have encountered are undervaluing themselves. So what's a good way to really determine a value for See, and that's difficult um mom if you're listening i'm going to continue to use you as an example <laughs> uh so thank you mom she's very lovely and she works very hard and right now she's watching my twin boys um so she is uh wonderful so that's a good shout out it Plus, is a good shout her out her bracelets are absolutely awesome she does have so. Awesome braces. She's a awesome nurse, and she's taking care of my children now. So thanks, mom. Um, so back to uh, the bracelets. Uh, so it's difficult because a you have to put a value on the skill, right? Right. Well, how many people can do that? That's a you know. Yeah, it's it's difficult. How many people um, have the patience to right. do it? So many bracelets. I mean, I can quilt. Um, I can hand stitch. I can do those things. Um, but this is at a level that even I'm like, oh no, I'm not even going to attempt. Um, I see your little nimble fingers and how they work. Um, it's, it's next to the, uh, gnomes that come out and make shoes. I'm like, no, right? no, thank you. No, thank well, you. So how long does it take her to make a bracelet? I so think that's, that's a reasonable question. See, that's, and that's what you do with time. You take your skill, you know, how long have you been working on this craft? Right. And you say, okay, what is that worth? Right now, if it's a skill that, um, that, that's very, very difficult and refined. That's that's going to be a, a larger price point than if someone's like, you know, I'm going to put in, you know, you know, you need to shovel snow. Well, that's how much is that worth? What? How big is the sidewalk? How long is the labor? How? Right. I mean, is it two feet or is it three inches? Right. You know, and if you're you're you know you know your neighbor kids coming over and you're like, okay, I'll give you a, you know, five bucks, to clear my driveway. And he's like, dude, there's two feet of snow out there. I ain't touching that with a 10 foot pole. <laughs> right. And I feel like I have a 50 bucks. He's like, oh yeah, all day, all day I'll be out there. So, you know, the, the skill level, how difficult. And then the time, just like, you know, and people don't do that. It's interesting. It's like, you know, cutting grass, how much would you pay for someone to cut your grass? You know, it depends how big it is, how big the hillside is. Um, and people don't do that with their own work. I think they, a lot of times, you know, really cut themselves short on what their product and what their I value is. I think so is. too. You know, you can pay a graphic designer $50 an hour. You can pay them $100 an hour. You can pay um, a woodworker $25 an hour or $75 an hour. So it's really, I think helping not only the listeners of this show, but people in general to value their hourly time and the what they are putting into whatever it is that they're creating is really important. And it doesn't seem that you can find anywhere online really like a table for exactly how much something is supposed to be worth. So and I think it seems it's, like that's a, a valuable piece. And it's interesting. I mean, there's this, you know, juxtaposition between mass produce and now artisan coming back. I mean, like with the Etsy and, and um, uh, local craftsmen coming in and craftswomen coming in and, and building their product. The, the problem is that they're then thinking that they have to almost compete then with the mass market. Mm -hmm. So they have to, you know, devalue their stuff so low so that the average buyer, you know, comes in and then says, oh, wait, I can buy the exact same thing, 30% less, and they look the same. So it really comes down to the story. Um, now, if you're that 
that individual, like my mom that has that bracelet, you know, you know, that, that comes from her heritage. That comes from the part of the world that her family came from. She did research on the tribes that used to make these Sami bracelets. And right, she, of course. she learned about them and she, she wanted to have that old craft again and, and do it by hand and, and do it right in the way that, that they used to do it. And then, you know, she's really building up and saving to go on a trip to see the area in which they used to be made to see, you know, the, um, the pewter, where the pewter's made and, and really understand the source of, of her inputs. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the reindeer, where did the, you know, she's never seen a reindeer. She's never been to those huge mass movements of, of deer, um, from area to area as they, I know very little about them, but how they travel and, and yeah, to see them in real life. It's really amazing stuff. It's like the the full circle and cycle of what she's doing. It's what makes it especially fantastic, I would say. Yeah, as compared to, you know, maybe a mass marketed same Sami bracelet, but are made in mass um, and there's, you know, there's not, there's not much there. There's not much soul there as in my, there's my little mom sitting behind, <laughs> you know, after work by hand, making these little duty bracelets so she yeah. can go uh, to Norway and Sweden and to, to visit where all of her product comes from and to, to meet the artisans that are, you know, spinning the, the pewter thread and to see where the, um, the deer are and those types of things. So I think there is, as you're, you're really invested in that story mm -hmm. um and and everybody has any every small artisan every small um, business owner has that story and i think it's that story is that what people really want to hear and and there's a great stories out there yep. especially in Vorokov. well um, it makes for fantastic yeah. marketing it really does for sure and so people are are absolutely paying attention to the stories of so many of the different businesses um particularly in the Viroqua area it um it certainly helps to sell things and it it doesn't matter whether it's uh awesome bracelets or food or whatever it may be the story does sell the product. Yeah, and it, sure. and it brings people in. Yep. Um, you know, when people come through a town like Viroqua or Lanesboro or um, Winona, they want they come for the story. Right. They, I mean, yeah, they can get a, a, a great meal from a trout in Chicago. I'm sure that there are, you know, great restaurants in Chicago. Of course. Um, but when you come to, you know, Viroqua and you want that that cup of coffee that tastes a little bit different, that they can see, you know, how it's made, they can they can taste it, they can, you know, go to the, the restaurant and see, hey, you know, you know, this came from this farm and we, we probably drove right by it on our way on our way through. So that people come for the story for the experience. Right. Um, Absolutely. And that's what we, we have here in Viroqua. We have the experience that people want to keep coming back to. Yep. And so, you know, because of the the ease of of relaying that experience and because of the lifestyle in Viroqua, would you say that this area of the world kind of lends itself to entrepreneurs and and creativity i think it does it's a great place to work to live and to be inspired mm -hmm. um it's it's well i am partial i i grew up in La Crosse and i uh <laughs> married a nice Viroqua girl and i'm here in Viroqua and i've been here for quite a quite a while uh, i think it's just it's just a it's a magical place if you can drive around through the hills and the streams and the it's you know when you pass the amish and the combine and it's just just a great place to be and it really can can clear your head and you know you can really focus on what you want to focus on and build your product and build your craft and whatever that may be and it it, it really it's really friendly that way there's yep. there's a so many small businesses small artisans in this area um per per populace sure. so you can really find friends in your craft maybe not your specific craft but yep. a craft like and people are ready to share their stories and experiences yes. i think too which is really valuable for people who are just starting their business this yeah. is a, a business friendly place yeah so we've established the the support system and some of the the important things when you are starting a business of refining your product and coming up with that good idea what are some other things that people really should be 
focusing on as they're moving forward with their business? Let's say they've they've got their their bracelet or their tea set or their bookshelf totally refined and ready to go. What's what's next? For starters, you got your bracelets out there tested. It's been, you know, nine months and they're beautiful still. There's, you know, you're tweaking a little thing here or there, or maybe you add the, the way you add the button has to be a little bit different or what sure. have you. Yep. Um, so you've worked out your product perfectly, right? And then you start building in your margin. You're building in your time. Okay, so I need to pay myself X amount of dollars per hour. And you almost had to be, you know, just, so specific you would stop watch it you know click or and then every time you take a break you click you, you know what i mean and really mm -hmm. figure out how much from from gathering the supplies to cutting them to sewing them if you're making that bracelet you almost have to start the stopwatch when you're ready to sit down and take off and then when it's complete you stop it bathroom sure. breaks you gotta stop that turn it back on and then figure out how much is your time worth and then how much is your product worth and then you have to have a margin for growth um, to make sure that um, you're able to go to the next level um, with with capacity, whether it be you know you know maybe now you can actually you know build in some capacity because now you can buy in bulk. You know what I mean? Or different things like that. Sure. Um, what is out there in Viroqua or otherwise for people that are ready to really start selling their product? You know. Um, should they be starting on social media? Should they be starting at craft fairs and farmers markets, or should they go for the brick and mortar? What's your advice, Peter? It's the the brick and mortar is first off very expensive. Sure, there's tons of overhead. Yep. Yeah, you have hours that you have to be there for, right? You yep. become less elastic in terms of your personal life. Sure. Um, someone has to be there. You know, the worst thing you can do is, you know, put up your shingle and then have the clothes sign out there, you know, you know, three days in a row and then people coming in because once they stay closed, if it's Saturday, Sunday, and they're coming in from, you know, Chicago or Twin Cities or Madison or La Crosse, they might not come back right away or maybe they're just going to walk by when they go into other things because, like I said, you, you have to be there then on those brick and mortars. So then, yeah, the, you know, you had... You got business insurance. You got the electricity, the water, the heat, um, the air conditioning because those those businesses have to be pretty temperature controlled right. uh, to be very comfortable for those individuals shopping in your area. You have extended hours. You have weekends. Staff. Um, staff. You know, if you can't be there all the time, and that that's expensive. Yes. Uh, very expensive. Um, whereas if you go through the social media, if you go through. Etsy, if you go through your own website, um, still your own website, you just have to be careful because when those orders are coming in, you really have to fulfill those orders um, because that's the last thing you want to do is disappoint right. um, with your new product. Right. Um, so brick and mortar, I would say, is would not be the first jump that I would take. You know, then you're you're all in at that point. Brick and mortar, <laughs> all in. Mm -hmm. All in, at least for the twelve months of the lease. Correct. Yes. Um so but yeah, but there's there's so many other ways in which you can can do it now with like I said, with Etsy and with your own um Instagram or social media, or maybe you just want to do farmers markets on Saturday in Viroqua. I mean there's then it's the cost is very low and you have how much exposure with those people driving by to maybe work up to buying in bulk and then getting that uh, brick and mortar and taking off from there. Sure. So it's all about just getting your business out mm -hmm. there and letting people see what you do. Let's talk about social media social just a little media. bit. I think that's a, always a good thing to touch on. How much social media do you use, Peter? Social media uses quite a bit. Um, we you know, we are, we have ads on there. We have campaigns with the Packers, with the Brewers. Everybody has a smartphone, mm -hmm. right? So if, you know, if a bank is on there, you know, promoting social media wise, I mean, you know, you know, what's important in terms yep. of, because that seems pretty non-traditional for a bank yep. um, to be doing that, but there's huge value with your customers, right? Yep. Your clients. So if you're, you're that, you know, that artisan tea shop, you know, if you're able to do a Facebook blast, you know, before Christmas or those types of things, or able to do those things in which, you know, you know, the, your, your audience will see this around Thanksgiving and be like, Hey, this would be a great tea set for my daughter. 
great, right? right? Or doing an online post, just an online post. Hey, friends and family, you know, on Facebook being like, hey, I have these tea sets. Um, if you, you know, have some pictures on there, if you're interested, if you're just getting started out, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like I said, those are going to be your, hopefully not your harshest critics, um, <laughs> but your biggest promoters right? um, is those friends and family that really can take that and look at value. And then, like I said, then it's just word of mouth. I think word of mouth is an important thing to talk about. So what about the value of relationship marketing? I think maybe, you know, the the amount of relationship marketing that you do as a, a professional for Associated Bank, I think that's something that certainly could be translated to small business. What does that look like? Oh, correct. And that that's huge because um, at the end of the day, it's that relationship building. Right. Um, you know, I mean, if you're if you're a great bread maker, right, and you know, and then you get it out there, and the word of mouth is like, hey, do you know, on Saturdays this guy sells awesome sourdough. You know what I mean? And you have it at a dinner with friends, and then they're like, great, when next Saturday? Every Saturday. You know what I mean? So that that word of mouth of that, um, and then if you see it on Instagram, you see, you know, we talked about that story being so important, and you go on their Instagram and you see them making it, and you see them baking it and you see them how they knead it and how they draw on the bread before the sourdough is baked. I mean, like I said, that's, that's what sells. I, I want to, I can see, I saw where my bread was made. You right. know what I mean? I, and then when I went to buy it, I saw the guy that actually made it. Right. Um, and I, and like I said, this is going off of this past weekend and I've, I've never went into a store and been like, Oh, I'm really going to enjoy this sourdough loaf because I took it and I threw it in my oven for 15 minutes. Like it told me to, and I pulled it out and it was hot. Mm -hmm. Um, That was a different experience than seeing it on social media, seeing it on Instagram, going there on Saturday, picking it out. We had a 10 pound pork roast. Um, that we've been baking since five o'clock or four <laughs> o'clock in the morning, because um, we have twin feeding, so we could put it at two, four, sure. <laughs> anytime in the morning, because those babies are hungry all the time. So we put the pork roast, and I was really not excited for the pork roast. <laughs> yeah, right? not for not the yet. pork roast. No, um, they uh, so and I went and I picked up the sourdough and some treats, and then I and then when I went over and visited with my friends and my and my relatives, I could tell them about this loaf, and I just saw it you know, on social media and I ran over and I, I bought it and we ate it and we, we shared a part of his story. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's good stuff. If you could give entrepreneurs one piece of advice as Peter Rude, the banker, and as Peter Rude, the human being, what would those pieces of advice be? Starting with Peter Rood, the human being. Do what you love. Okay. Do what you love and do it well. Yep. Awesome. Okay. And as Peter Rood, the banker. Do what you love and do it well. So it's the same. It is the same. Banker or just Peter Rood. Because if you do what you love, you should do it well. And if you do what you, if you do what you love and you do it well, you're going to be a happy individual. Yep. You're going to be a happy person, both on the, the, the business side and on the personal side. If, you, if, you're, if you're really enjoying your craft, you're enjoying your job, you know, and in your job. And it's like when I go to work, that's like my second family. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, you know, I see those people more than I see my wife, well, more than I see my kids. So if you don't, if you don't love it, you know, you know, don't, don't spend all that time. Right. You only, we only got so much and. You know, so if you're like, hey, you know, I really don't like my job. You know, I really, you know, but I love making shelves. I love making shelves. Well, make shelves. You love it. Do it well and then sell them and, and be your own woodworker. Yeah. Yeah, that's a beautiful sentiment. What about the, you know, the people that say that's that's super fine and dandy, but I need to have insurance and Correct. I need to make sure that my kid's daycare is paid for. What do you, how do you answer that? Then, then yeah, but then don't, don't give up on it. Don't give up on when it, when it gets really hard and you don't have the time, continue, you know, persevere. It's hard. I mean, I have, I mean, I'm not the only one with two kids that are crying at night and want to be fed. I'm, right. I'm not going to, you know, you know, be up here and, and preach it. Um, but 
you, you know, you have to, you know, find time for that, you know, find time for you a little bit. Don't lose yourself. But then that hobby, the thing you love, if you, you know, you're like, Hey, I have to have this job for insurance. I have to have this job because I have to pay daycare, you know? Yeah. Then, then do that job, do it well. You're not going to love it, but then find the time to do what you love and really build it up. And if you're, if you've just succumb to the fact that you are going to be selling XYZ products and you'd rather be selling bookshelves, you know, do it well, invest heavy, um, set yourself up for success so you can retire early. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can do what you like. And then you can do what you want. But no, but that's, that'd be the last resort. You know what I mean? Really, I, I think that we really get caught up, even in Viroga, we get caught up with the things that we, that we have to do, with the jobs that we have to have, um, but then we don't find the time to cultivate what we really want to do. So this is almost a call to like, you know, it can be 45 minutes a day. It could be, you know, wake up an extra 45 minutes and drink coffee and sketch out your business plan. Sketch mm -hmm. out what you want to sell. Sketch out what you want to make. Sketch out what you love. What do, you, what do I love doing? And take those 45 minutes and, and make it a plan and make it an actionable, smart um, measurable goal orientated, you know, plan so that one day you can walk out, you can mic drop it at work mm -hmm. and be like, I'm out, I'm doing what I love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then talk to your banker to make sure that, uh, <laughs> they have all of your stuff in order <laughs> before you mic drop it and be like, talk Oh, to your banker. Remember to oh, schedule your appointments with I, your local I, bank. I, uh, I mic dropped before I figured out how I'm going to sell my product. That'd, that'd be not so good. No, it wouldn't be. And you know, I think that happens a little bit more than people realize. I think there's yes. some mic dropping and I think there's some, going into business. And I also think there's going into business unprepared. Correct. And so, you know, part of the reason that we do this show and part of the reason that the Viroqua Chamber Main Street wants to be able to get this information to people at accessible time periods, any time of the day is because we want to try to prevent some of those unfortunate mic drops, um, and make sure that we can, um, give people the information that they need so that they can make decisions that they need to make. And this is the least judgmental atmosphere in the entire universe because we have all seen mistakes. We have all made mistakes and we're all human beings. And so that's one of the reasons that we do what we do. So hopefully and that's of that's, some value. That's really important. Like I said, you're, the, the chamber of commerce is, is so important because you can come in you know, and, you know, so you've been sketching out that plan, you know, every day, those 45 minutes before the kids get up and, mm -hmm. you know, like, Hey, I want to, I want to start making my product now and you made it. And then you're like, okay, how am I going to sell this? How does Etsy work? How does this, you know, you can join the chamber. You can come and talk to Nora and be like, so how does this work? You know, and having that success you know, like we said before the mic drop, before you, <laughs> right. you know, burn the boats and, um, and, and do what Maybe you Maybe we love. should call that the mic smash for the those mic. that are. Yes. Cause usually <laughs> after you, you know, after you smash the mic, it really doesn't work anymore. Right. Um, so, so we, we want to build, uh, for success, um, and have that plan. Um, so, and, and, uh, you know, and a lot of people want to be like, go in there and be like, and give 110%, but you have to be ready. You gotta be ready. Yep. Um, and start small and you can grow and grow and develop. And then one day you're just like, you know, if I did discontinue my job, I can pay for insurance. Right. I can pay for daycare or wait, I like to go to daycare part time. So, you know, figuring all that out. Right. Um, and then seasonality, tourism, how does it affect your business? You know, if you're like, Hey, I had a great three months, it, you know, it was October, November and December. Right. And then you decide to quit your job and be like, yeah, I can do it. But then turn around January, February, March. Ooh, you had some rough months. Um, so making sure that you have that, you know, seasonality built into your business, that tourism part, if it's a tourist heavy, or maybe, you know, you build bookshelves, but you know, on Etsy, your shipping's going to be, you know, through the roof. Right. So yeah, you sold 10 to family and friends. But you know what I mean? You, there's some other kinks to work out before you take it on full time. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. We want success. We do want success. We want to build success and happiness. Yep. And I think Veroqua is the best place to do it. I think so too. I think so too. So, well, I guess we should probably wrap this one up. Um, I am Nora Rowan Schmidt from the Veroqua Chamber Main Street, your host for 54665. And Peter, thank you so very much for being here today. No problem. Cue the exit music. Oh, yeah. Feed Cute. the birds. <laughs> We're going to have Peter Shoppins. sing us out today because that's just how we roll. I forgot my sheet music.